Hi guys, uh, I'm here with Andrew Johnson and uh, we are going to talk about... Well, they used to be called UFOs, didn't they? But yeah. they're not called that anymore. They've been rebranded. It's kind of like when uh, Cold Fusion was rebranded to Low Energy Nuclear Reactions or, you know. That's all around, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I'm in an undisclosed drain pipe, uh, hence the audio. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here with Andrew. And I have to say on camera for the first time, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Andrew, because if it wasn't for you putting me in contact with uh, John Hutchison, I'd have never get had an opportunity to uh, get some samples from him mm -hmm. and analyze those samples and then find these uh, self-similar clusters uh, mm -hmm. that uh, looked like the Gions of Wheeler from the 1954 paper, uh, it would turn out now. And it would never have led down the path of realizing, in my view, that these, this is coherent matter and it is the same as ball lightning and this technology is all related and it can oh, yeah. and it can influence matter, the structure of matter, and it can do all kinds of magical things which I think are uh, in the technology of UAPs, as they're now called. Yes, yes, I think it's important to realise that, uh, and some of the things we're going to try and cover briefly tonight, that yes, we're talking about technology, you've been looking at some of the science behind that technology, and it does all, there is a big crossover in this, I mean, but we were just talking before we started doing the stream about people like John Alexander mm -hmm. being associated with John Hutchison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, John Alexander has done a book on UFOs. He's, he's talked about UFOs publicly for two or three, four decades by now, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I don't know whether Bob would agree, but Alexander is one of the people that knows a lot more mm -hmm. than he lets on. He knows a lot more about the black programs that, you know, as you've talked about, condensed matter. Um, and, you know, he is very interested in things like ball lightning, you know. Yeah, well, why wouldn't you be? I mean, these aerial phenomena you see are not just uh, things that may actually be alien craft or our own craft. Uh, they could actually just be manifestations of the natural phenomena yeah. that, yeah. personally, for my, my, yeah. my own belief, is that the uh, these uh, technologically produced devices are using this natural phenomena, and then why wouldn't they? In fact, you could only use something that was possible in nature. So you would have to find something in nature that was able to give you these properties that we witness in these so-called fantastical craft. So, uh, what we've done actually for you is uh, we have, um, uh, if I just stop the, the, this over here, we've got the, the uh, down, down in the bottom left here, we have the score, because uh, unfortunately the England-Denmark match <laughs> went over, and we have um, this uh, paper uh, uh, here, uh, which you can see. Um, uh, which is this unclassified document, which was this breakdown of the preliminary assessment of unidentified aerial phenomena. And uh, this was from 25th of June, 2021. Mm. Now, I actually have only skim read this. But you, mm. You've actually read a lot of it, haven't you? I read the whole thing, because I mean, the, the joke of it is it's only nine pages. Yeah. <laughs> one of those is the title page, yes. one is the appendix. Yes. So you've really basically got seven pages. <laughs> I don't think any of those pages are full. No. You know? It's, it's a comical disappointment to many. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's laughable, really, when you actually read it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there are no specific cases uh, mentioned. Really. I think possibly one might be mentioned, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they basically say, "Well, we've we've ha we've got a record of 144 cases of weird phenomena, UAPs, mm -hmm. as they now call, now call them. They don't even mention UFO, um, and they basically say, well, 'Well, we're still not really sure what these are. We 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 th we think they might be something, and they're worth investigating, but we don't know how to investigate them.'" Because we haven't got a, a classification system, so give us a load of money, and then we'll develop a reporting and classification system to be unified across all the forces, and then you know we'll move forward. So really, and, really, it looked like a public document that says, "Yes, there's something interesting. We don't know what it is. We don't know how they work. And can yeah. you give us some more money?" That's yeah, that, essentially that, that, how you yeah, summarise that, it. That's essentially how I summarise it. I think that's a, a fair assessment. You know, there's there's nothing really new in this document, and in fact. It's, it's going into reverse, you know, it's, it's, it's actually a reverse disclosure. And I, I briefly heard uh, Louis Elizondo, this will probably mention him again in a bit, but he was talking about this saying, oh yeah, this is the unclassified report, and he actually says that on the, on the footer of each page. But there is apparently a classified report as well. Yeah, I've heard some rumours about that, that there's like uh, um, 
I don't know, 14 videos and they run for 60, right. 60 minutes and the, the, the stuff that you see in those videos is absolutely, uh, looks, look, looks like uh, um, science fiction. And also uh, in this classified part, um, apparently there is uh, this list of technologies that have been tried uh, with various levels of success, but we have no idea if this is just wishful thinking on the part of people that might want to be spreading uh, you know, information that may or may not be true. And, and the key point that's come out in the in the media, I don't think it's not so, not so obvious in the report particularly, but in the media they're saying that this is a UFO threat, and we've talked about this. They the media have been talking about this UFO threat assessment mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. unit, mm -hmm. which Lou, Lou Elizondo allegedly headed up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but uh, you know, Rich D. Hall he did an analysis of Lou Elizondo's earlier interviews from about a couple of years ago when he first sort of sprang onto the scene. And um, he, he, you know, part, apparently from the statement analysis, part of what he was saying might have been true, but some of it definitely wasn't, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. or, or almost certainly wasn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this guy is not to be trusted. Uh, and a dark journalist, Daniel List, has done a, a good analysis of the whole Louis Elizondo and this To The Stars Academy, Tom DeLong thing. Tom Long has been sidelined now, and they've really brought out Chris Mellon, mm -hmm. haven't they? And Lou Elliott, yeah. they're sort of the two faces. And, and I understand that Hal Putoff uh, has also come away from the project, is I that right? I believe so, yeah. yeah. yeah I, think, I don't know. Daniel List has gone with this a little bit, and I haven't followed it all. But yeah, you've got people like Hal Putoff has been sniffing around this. Certainly he was part of the TTSA. Mm -hmm. He may have distanced himself from it now, because that hasn't panned out perhaps they, the way they wanted it to. So, so the thing that I think is the key in this is the threat assessment angle. And they've talked about, I mean, I, I clicked on an article in The Guardian uh, today and that openly said, oh, the, the US is worried about the security or, you know, issue with these aerial phenomena, yeah. you know. So that's what they're pushing. Uh, and you want to know really why they're doing that. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, and so um, I had the pleasure, actually, I was contacted by a, a party who said, you know, there's this journalist, he's Australian, and uh, he would like to maybe interview you, you're okay with that? I said, yeah, yeah, uh, what's it about? Oh, it's about an identified aerial phenomenon. And I thought, well, that's okay, I've got something that he won't expect me to say. And, uh, you know, uh, this, I, I just like about a couple of hours before the, the interview, I took a look at his website and I saw that he was seemed to be very well respected and being published in a bit. And I thought, okay, so the guy looks like he's serious, and I'll, I'll take a, 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 some time with him. Why not? And uh, we had we had a good interview, and uh, that's on remote remoteview.icu, and you can see the first half of that on uh, the MFMP's YouTube. And uh, the guy is called Ross Coulthart, and he's a fantastic storyteller, absolutely fantastic. And he came out with a documentary on, I think it was on something seven or something from an Australian yeah, channel. Channel nine, was it? Channel, channel, channel right? seven, channel nine, 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 nine some nine, Australian. Nine, yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you think of it? I thought it was quite interesting. I thought it was just going to be selling, and it, um, did, it does do selling of the Louis Elizondo and the yeah, Chris Miller. Yeah, to a certain you know, He bigs them up to a reasonable extent, and I thought, oh God, you know, it's not going to be all of that. But then he goes into a couple of other mm -hmm. interesting cases, mm -hmm. which kind of surprised me. Mm -hmm. uh, and he comes across pretty well as an mm -hmm. enthusi enthusiastic and affable chap. Um, so it, it's quite an interesting documentary that you can find. Uh, which channel is it on, Because you sent me uh, link, didn't you? Well, you can get it on YouTube. Yeah, so it's definitely on YouTube, the yeah, whole yeah, thing. And it's, yeah. it was recently aired, wasn't it? I think within yes. the last couple of weeks, yeah, I forget yeah, the yeah. exact uh, date. So it, it, that, again, was put out in, in, in the build-up of this... UFO I think it was called the UAP. phenomenon, wasn't it? Yeah, so you want to look at yeah, for yeah, the yeah, word yeah, phenomenon, phenomenon Ross Coulthart. Right. And that's I think it's, it's almost like a trailer for his book that's coming out later. Yeah, in he the mentions year. his book a couple of times. I think it's out, but I don't know. Maybe no, no, I, I pre ordered it. It's coming out oh, uh, okay, in right. like next month or the end of this month, maybe. Right, right. Uh, right. It's only nine ninety nine, so you can get that. Oh, uh, right. I think it's a digital copy. I, I pre ordered that. But uh, the interesting thing about when I, I had that um, uh, interview with Ross, I, I talked about something. Um, which I had experienced as a less than 10 year old, so uh, we're talking uh, 30 plus years ago. And this was my father who was a senior mason in the uh, UK. And he uh, asked me and my brothers and sisters to come downstairs and, uh, and said, look up into the night sky. And uh, so we, we dutifully did what we were asked to do. And uh, these four bright lights went blip, blipped on, went and then flashed and disappeared. 
and he said like right go to bed and I never thought too much about it you know mm-hmm. and and so uh, <laughs> I think he was a bit taken aback but that's my my experience and so what happened was that um, uh, I've been reflecting upon that actually like I'd never done before and I thought listen my, my father was in the uh, Navy but for a period of time not a long yeah. time just in national service but he was a mason and I thought, what's more likely, that my father has contact with aliens and, and, and can ask them to put a show on for him, or that either through the Masons or through his uh, Navy contacts, that, that they were um, doing something for us kids uh, as a gift to him for whatever reason, I have no idea. Um, uh, and, and this was just a show of technology. Now, when you look at what, when that was, if I was born in 1972 and I was seven or eight, that was before 1980. Uh, or around at that time. And so we're talking about something that was uh, able to fly. Now, could it have been, it could have technically been one large, long craft because the the uh, spacing between these four lights, they did not change. Yeah. Um, and so it could have just come into the thing, shifted, shifted, shifted. That would that would help explain the, their co-location and the, 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 the distance between each other being exact. Um, and and so on. So it could have been one craft, or it could have been four in in a in a line. Um, but um, w- whatever, <laughs> this was not an aircraft that was doing manoeuvres that any aircraft at the yeah. time would be able to do, or even now that, yeah. that we are generally aware of. And so I believe that in 1980, it, it was the technology. If you want to conclude that this is correct would be capable of doing the same kind of manoeuvres uh, that, that they're talking about in these, um, these disclosures yeah. that are coming out. This is starts to get to the nub of what this Pentagon document is a cover for, I think, because they claim, no, we don't know what these things are, we don't know whether they, they might be alien, they don't mention that in this document, but that's certainly been alluded to in the press. We really don't know what these things are, they've got advanced aerial capabilities, but this is just a total lie. You know, from the the, the account that you've you know um, stated there. Also, I, a few weeks ago, you advised me that Mark Mark McCandlish, uh, had been uh, had died. Yeah, and uh, apparently he was due, like I think in June. Or he, June. Was due, he was due to testify yeah. before the committee. Now, for people that don't know who Mark McCandlish is, they just put his name into YouTube, and they will very quickly find several videos. I think quite a few actually of him talking uh, about knowledge of something that he called the alien reproduction vehicle or yeah. he said this name was given to him by another contact called brad Sorensen, <laughs> who had been to an air show i think in uh, california somewhere it might have i think it was some some facility associated with scott works <laughs> and um, this was in uh, i think 1988 i mean i can't i can't remember the date of this story and i've put this in my book a little bit about this in my books uh, Finding the Secret Space Program that Knowledge, which are free PDF downloads from Check the Evidence. Um, mm. But uh, Mark McCandlish, he told this story the first time I heard it was uh, in 2003, but he told it at Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was in 2001. Yeah. It was, and he, was that like in the first week of September in 2000? No, it was May. It, it was in May. earlier in the year. Okay, yeah, 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 before yeah, 9 11. Yeah, yeah. And he held up this uh, drawing mm. which he'd actually developed because the, his friend uh, had managed to get quite a decent technical description mm-hmm. of this alien reproduction vehicle. And, um, you know, he, he, drew, he drew it all out and he put this document up in an office somewhere or he gave it to somebody who then put it up in their office. And an Air Force officer apparently came into this office, saw this technical diagram that mm-hmm. Mark McCandless had developed and, and said, where the hell did you get that? Take that down. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was taken away according to what Mark McCandless was told. Yeah. So... And that you know these stories go back to the eighties as well, and he, and he, I think he alluded to the the, the date um, dating to be something like nineteen sixties when the CRV was probably and, and that is a very very interesting date. So um, it, you have this pattern of uh, of information. I'm going to run through a couple of things that I've talked about in the past, and I think they're really key to uh, maybe getting a, a view on whether. These are possibly our uh, mm-hmm. devices, human devices. Now, the, the, what the term alien reproduction vehicle implies that there are alien vehicles and that this was uh, taken or, or, or sort of back-engineered mm-hmm. from that. So um, 
at, at no point in this am I saying or suggesting that there aren't alien vehicles uh, out there. Um, but you have that other case, which I think uh, in, in Ross Coulthard's uh, um, video presentation, he was talking about, uh, uh, he was talking to this guy and he was saying that there's the F-15s or something that, that they were uh, interacting with this so-called Tic Tac aircraft. And the, the, the key point here in that uh, testimony is that the, the, um, the Tic Tac went to a point in, in space, in, in the sky, where the aircraft were meant to go and rendezvous as part of this exercise. And the point is, is like, oh, isn't it amazing? These air, the, the, this Tic Tac knew where they were going and they got there beforehand. And it's like, what, what, what possi- is Ockham's razor then? Yeah, exactly. What is Ockham's razor? In the documentary, they don't discuss the possibility that they, the craft went there because the Air Force told them where they were going to go or where they needed But they to did be. say that this was only about information was available to, mm. the, to a small group mm. that, that were running the exercise. Yeah. So, I mean, the Ockham's razor there is that they are literally saying this is our craft. Right? I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's if I didn't know and hadn't witnessed these things that my father had asked us to witness. And if I can sort of interject with another famous UFO incident, the Rendlesham incident in the mm-hmm. UK in 1980, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Richard D. Hall has done quite a bit of investigation into that, and many others have as well. But he sort of came to the conclusion that because of the language that some of the airmen were using, and I think it's particularly true of some of what Colonel Holt said, Colonel Charles Holt, what that might have been is that they were landing at an advanced type of drone near the base, which was a nuclear armed base, as a part of uh, part of a test operation, mm-hmm. similar to the scenario you've just described mm-hmm. with the rendezvousing of planes mm-hmm. with this object there, to see how people would react mm-hmm. in this scenario with a supposed alien craft landing or flying through airspace that they were involved in. Uh, and, and so, and this is something that Jacques Vallée actually mm-hmm. talked about mm-hmm. as well. He, he suggested that the Rendlesham incident was a psychological operation to mm. test the response yeah. of... Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's what's going on. It might even have been when, when, when my father was having us shown this craft, what was the response? Yeah. And the response from five of his children that span a decade... From, from practically adult down to, to uh, you know, six or five year old, mm-hmm. was, oh, all right, Dad, good night. Yeah, yeah. It's like... You just kind of accept it, you, don't you? Uh, well, uh, literally, I, don't, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't think of it almost for the most of mm-hmm. the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, I didn't think of it. One of our early sponsors for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project was absolutely very keen on UFOs. And he kept trying to push me in that direction, and I thought, okay, but I didn't look. And it, and it was like, <laughs> that, that's how much I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten it. You know, mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't important. Um, it, it, and so, you know, maybe even we were an experiment. I don't know. Maybe. You don't know. Do you like, you want to try these, these visuals on all kinds of different people. And I've also talk, talked about... Um, the, the, the fact that this person uh, that stayed with me, his girlfriend in North Hawaiian Islands, was a diving instructor and used to take the elites out into the islands. And uh, um, they, uh, and this was... <laughs> anyway, she said um, there were um, these things flying around underwater and they would fly out. And I said this, I said these things before the disclosure of the thing going in and out of the water um, in this recent disclosure. Yeah, yeah. And she said that they were going in and flying around with impunity yeah. in and out of the water. And uh, when she started talking about it, well, her life was uh, ceased to exist, as it were. She, wow. she, she, she stopped uh, breathing, let's put it like that. And when I spoke about this to another guest I had a couple of years later, who was from Hawaii also, she just turned excitedly to her partner and said, I told you! saw these a kid and recently and and so there's definitely something going on in, in, in off the uh, north uh, and of course uh, coast you, you, of you, may be, you may be familiar with bill cooper's book behold a pale horse mm-hmm. it's in the early part of that book that he discusses when he was at sea you mm-hmm. know in, in, the, in the u.s navy and he saw craft c- coming out of the water mm-hmm. and going up mm-hmm. either into space or high, certainly out of sight in the sky and then coming back again yeah and, right and, you know he that was his kind of um, introduction to the whole idea of, uh, of, you know, advanced technology that could do that. and um, So let, let, let's talk on that. In this uh, kind of thing with Ross Coulthard, I think even Christopher Mellon 
-hmm. And uh, 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 um, uh, who is who is it? Um, uh, Louis Elizondo. That they, they all have this kind of narrative that we, it's doing things that we don't know how it can be achieved. Um, they're impossible, uh, and and there's no technology, and that we don't have any idea. And I disagree. I flatly disagree with that assessment. And I don't know whether that's all they're allowed to say, or whether you know they want to toe a line which is, um, you know, not too sensational at this point. Um, but I can pretty much tell you uh, that what we have seen in the Vega experiments and what we know about ball lightning, they can do all of these things. Yes, I agree. We know that ball lightning can carry a mass and it would appear to shield its mass and inertia. That's basically I mean, good, stopping gravity. God, back to other things that we, you and I spent a lot of time talking about. This is all interrelated with what happened on 9-11. You know, and I make the case that none of the UFO community is talking about 9-11. Mm -hmm. Well, you think it might, might think I'm a wanderer. Why should they? Mm -hmm. But that, again, ties into some of the research you've done with the Hudson effect, mm -hmm. because you and I essentially uh, started talking to each other mm -hmm. because of Dr. Judy Wood's research into 9-11. Well, no, speci which, specifically, I was doxxed by someone who, who claimed I was mad for right. going down that thought process. Right. And, and five months after that person doxxed me, I, happened, I, I was informed about this. And I went to the page, and the exact same day, you you had written something saying, "Well, he might be bonkers, but what he's talking about this is is correct." Right. And so I want to talk about something look, that, that that kind of fits into this, and and this was um, the work of Eric Davis. Because yes. Eric Davis, um, who you might be aware, had this uh, Admiral Wilson uh, release. Eric Davis also uh, did this study on ball lightning. Yes. Um, uh, and it was commissioned at the end, I think, in October two thousand and one. It was like anyone in the world. That knows anything about ball lightning and related technologies. Now, ball lightning is coherent matter. Coherent matter, according to the Lockheed Martin uh, pa pa patent, is able to provide propulsion, and we know that ball lightning can do uh, uh, anti-gravity-like effects. And uh, and and that's 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 in a very small summary. So. Eric Davis is looking at this, and I'm gonna, I've am going i got a couple of slides here which I'm going to share, and I think probably um, I'm going to hope that uh, England uh, still stay at 2-1, because we're going <laughs> to lose that, lose that in the background <laughs> for, for you. I said to Bob, what's football? <laughs> carry on, carry on. <laughs> I said, if, this, if, if the football match goes into extra time, it's like, no! <laughs> End time, so it would appear that um, we have won. So a yay for England. I'm sorry for the Danes, um, but uh, I'm not bothered. Everybody. Uh, anyway, the point is we can now go on uh, with the presentation quick. So, um, so let's talk uh, with UAPs with Andrew Johnson. So, um, what 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 we're saying actually is that um, uh, the, the argument is these may be a threat. Uh, uh, give us money, uh, and uh, y you know, my uh, we don't really know how they work, and, and so on. I don't think that is honest. I don't think that is honest. Now, the individuals may be not privy to the information, but I don't think that's honest. There is technology, and there was uh, signs that that technology could be delivered as early as uh, this work which was done by, uh, said by Tesla. And this is here, you can see it says, how about aerial navigation, Dr. Tesla was ask, asked. He considered for a moment or two and then replied with great deliberation. The application of this principle will give the world a flying machine unlike anything that has ever been suggested before. It will have no planes, no screw propellers or devices of any kind hitherto used. It will be small and compact, excessively quick, swift, and above all, perfectly safe in the greatest storm. It can be built of any size and can it carry any weight at, that may be desired. And this was published in The Sun at New York, 1911, Tesla Promises Big Things. Now, there's a few things you've got to draw your attention to here. Perfectly safe in the greatest storm. You have these people saying that they're able to stand there where there's a very high wind current and they're not moving. 
and go against the wind. That is covered by this 1911 mm -hmm. statement by Tesla. It can be built of any size. These things have been shown to be any it's size. Just about, yes. And, can, and look like they can carry any weight, right? About, yes. And then the other thing is it has no planes. What is no planes? That, like no, no wings no, or anything. Okay, really, and yeah. no uh, propellers, no screw propellers like a helicopter. Uh, and so everything you see here is as it, these devices are described yeah. to be in 1911. Now, as I understand it, I might be wrong in saying this, but there's there's some school of thought that says Werner von Braun was working at Los Alamos National Laboratory. There's even been German-made um, uh, uh, sort of dials and stuff found from this period um, there, uh, bought at an auction or something. And then Werner von Braun then went to uh, 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 Germany and worked there and then came back after the war as part of that uh, paperclip program mm. I might have got that wrong but you you know more about those kind well, of I, I certainly haven't heard the bit about before the war mm -hmm. that and Los Alamos but you know Los Alamos is heavily uh, involved in all of this mm -hmm. you know and uh, I've written a bit about that in my books but uh, yeah I mean there's a whole kind of story of how this stuff has been originally you know captured by the Nazis or there's talk of cr crashes and I think in that film you sent me the Greer, Greer film he talks about crash in 1920 doesn't he he mentioned this yeah. body yeah he does that, that, that was new to me yeah that yeah. was new yeah. to me yeah. Yeah. so you know how long has this this been going on we don't we don't know but I mean there's plenty of evidence and one of the people I came into very <clears> uh, close and quite lengthy communications with was Edgar Fouché mm -hmm. who talks a lot about the two and, and if you've heard of this thing the TR3B any listeners that have heard to that heard of that that was the TR3B originally came from Edgar Fouché in 1998 mm -hmm. and I, I, I interviewed him for five hours and I've written uh, put his account in my book Finding the Secret Space Program Removing Truth's Protective Layers and that's available for free so there's a whole other thread with that we've talked about Mark McCandless thread you've talked about the um, Lockheed Martin investigation well, well we're going to we're going to show I'm going to build on that I'm going to build right. on that so there's, there's, there's all this stuff in the background yeah. which, which leads in similar directions in that there's alternative energy technology alternative propulsion technology you know alternative uh, understandings of the way that matter behaves and mm -hmm. can be manipulated you know and that, of course, ties into John Hutchison. It ties into Eric Davies, as you said, mm -hmm. and, and they're probably a couple. So we're going to we're going to draw that out. So essentially, um, one of the people was brought in, at, uh, uh, Winston Bostick. You know, I think it was 1948 to take the H bomb, which uh, uh, um, Wheeler had been involved in in making, that came up with the Gions. Um, he uh, was to take that and try and make it into fusion, domestic fusion technology. And what he did uh, was he had. Uh, basically high energy short duration discharges uh, from multiple locations that went over a, a magnetic field and this looks very much like the patent uh, from Lockheed Martin using the Aronhoff bomb effect and creating coherent matter waves and, and beams thereof and so um, you have something and, and, and what happened is he started to present this work in 1957 and said that basically this could explain everything from the microcosm to the macrocosm and one of the presentations he gave was this one and I'm going to just show it here and this was um, in uh, January the 31st 1958 in the Albuquerque Journal and it's about uh, his uh, concept was that this technology would allow for a two and a half million mile per hour motor uh, and the, the application of what was he called uh, um, uh, condensed plasmoids. And uh, of course we now know these are much more complicated than he, he understood them to be. Um, and here it is, it says, a space of motors reaching speeds of 700 miles a second, two and a half million miles an hour, were described Wednesday to the American Astronautical Society they don't exist yet, but they should be possible, said Dr. Winston H. Bostick, professor of physics at Stephen Institute of Technology. They would be plasma motors. In this case, plasma means a cloud of ionized or electrically charged gas. The idea is to use pulses of electric current and magnetism to get the gas particles moving at fantastic speeds. They, uh, then they could be shot out of the motor to produce a forward thrust similar to an expanding chemical gases, which come out of the tailpipe of an ordinary rocket. Such a motor would work only in the vacuum of space. At two and a half million miles an hour, a ship could reach Mars in 15 to 20 hours. So all you would need, what you would need is you would need to set up a company that was very good at getting heavy things into space. And then once you're there, you could deliver a device like this as being discussed 
1957 or 1950, I think it's 1957, 1958, yeah. um, to get to Mars in 15 to 20 hours. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of pretend that you were doing it in a very slow way and get a lot of money for doing it like that and then just deliver a thing that gets you there in 15 to 20 hours because you had it up your sleeve for half a decade plus, half a century plus. But uh, anyway, um, so uh, the principle is somewhat like that, aimed at getting peaceful power from the H-bomb reaction. The electric current and magnetic forces are used to make ionized hydrogen atom cores fuse together and produce power. Now, my point about this is, and I will talk about this, the ARV, I will talk about that, I'll talk about this in terms of ancient archaeology, and I'll talk about it with observations and the Hutchison effect and Ken Shoulders and so forth. But um, before I do that, and this, this will be in other presentations uh, in the coming months, uh, weeks and months, but um, this is the ball lightning study that I was talking about. Now, I won't go into it in completely. I've, I've done a thorough review of this in the past. Uh, so there's a ball lightning study by Eric Davis, uh, commissioned late 2001, reported May 2003. And it says the first new concept is atmospheric maser cavitation, here, maser cavitation. The second concept is based on the electromagnetic vortex plasmoids generated by micro discharge devices. This, and it's specified later in the document that this is Ken Shoulders' work and sustained by quantum vacuum energy. I disagree with this. It is something that comes from the vacuum, uh, uh, not necessarily the quantum, but there is uh, energy that you can harness from the vacuum, and it is something that allows it to tractor through. I will talk about this in great and explicit detail moving forward. And the third concept is this, and this classification code means uh, space and air aerospace. Um, and, and so they classified it for that reason, programmed by the Air Force, funded in the 1950s and 60s. I would suggest that this is the ARV program. And so this is, an, in my view, an explicit admission. This means that Eric Davis, who's with the, uh, Adam, uh, Admiral Wilson, mm -hmm. knows of this technology. I would say and so. Eric Davis worked with Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff started monitoring the MFMP in 2013 when we produced this radiation coming out of our Chalani cells in October 2013. I didn't know that, I just had this contact by uh, Earth Tech Texas. It wasn't until 2017 when I made the connection between Ken Shoulders and, and, and John Hutchison that I reached out to them because Ken Shoulders unfortunately passed away. And uh, then uh, I got the cold shoulder when I said this explains Lennar and it also explains a lot, lot more. Um, and that's when I found, I found out that, that uh, Hal Putoff worked there. And yeah, so, I mean, he was only interested in what you knew. He, he wasn't interested. Yeah, but uh, no, I think I think I, I understood in 2017 that that initial emission of radiation when you interact hydrogen was an absolute signature of the effect that leads you down a path where you understand the full gamut of technology. Yeah, and it yeah, wasn't yeah. until much later that I read the Christopher P. Tinsley interview with uh, Martin Fleischmann in, in um, Infinite Energy, where he's saying we were working on four things, cold fusion was one of them, one was like superconductivity and metal, another one was whatever he mentioned, and there was something that they didn't mention, but there's a whole block in that interview, which is the only block where uh, there's kind of, it looks like something has been edited out, but ah. the interviewer starts talking about anti-gravity prior to yeah. that part yeah. of the yeah. discussion. Yeah. So, uh, categorically, I think that this is the, the keys to the kingdom, as yes. it were. And it is co coherent matter, and that's what does low energy nuclear reactions, but it's also the key to... The, the, the very fact that Eric Davis the very fact that Eric Davis um, is uh, connected with the, and he actually, the, the, the paper, if you look at it, I'm gonna show you here now, um, the, um, the, his organization, uh, if I can get the right mouse, <laughs> I've got too many mouses in front of me. If you actually look at this uh, paper um, here, and I, I, I'll, I'll give the links, um, but you look at this paper here, um, it's a ball lightning study by Eric W. Davis by the wonderfully called warp drive metrics. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's just hilarious. It's like you're rubbed, it's being rubbed in your face. And it's a study for the Air Force. This guy is, is not messing around. He knows a lot. Yeah, he knows a lot. That, that's absolutely uh, the case. Um, so uh, you have this connection between ball lightning, anti-gravity, because we have shown that you can have a, 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 a a, a, a coherent matter plasma mm -hmm. ball, a ball of, you know, ball lightning inside a, a Vega reactor, and that can hold a very large piece of uh, tungsten relative to its size and move it around as if it had no mass at all. 
you know, um, it, 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 and we videoed that, and we've yeah. also shown how it can do all of the things described in the Lockheed Martin pattern that we will come to. So, um, so let's go back to the slides here. Uh, so this is the Eric Davis study. Then you've got to talk about what Ken Shoulders said in his uh, 2010 interview that I transcribed with uh, John Hutchison. And he says, Mike, on the subject of uh, gravity, I don't give a hoot about gravity as long as there's a source of propulsion. Propulsion is as fundamental as you can get. It's controllable gravity. Directional control over any force you want. Sure, you can liken it to gravity, but yeah, I'll take propulsion any day. Now, why is that so important? Because anti-gravity, you need something to be anti-against, right? But propulsion, you can work in an like, anti-gravity mode, but you can also, like, against gravity, mm -hmm. and you can also work in space. This technology does both, and it also works in the water. And as yeah. we've seen with ball lightning, a ball lightning can travel through things if it's in its neutral mode and the material inside its charge and mass and, and, and everything is also said by Ken Shoulders in that same transcript the charge is screened so somehow you get this thing that acts as one electron but it also is basically it's like one electron having to go through things so it's like if the electron doesn't interact because its wave function is so big because it's big, big coherent matter it can pass through something so when it goes into water a different medium it doesn't see that medium it doesn't see it and so it, it explains how something can go from the air to the water and out, like that testimony that was given to me about that woman that uh, sadly had a life taken from her, it, from uh, um, uh, out, outside of um, uh, the, the Hawaiian Islands, and like these more recent disclosures of these things coming in and out of the water. So, um, so uh, let's go back to our slides here. So th this Ken Shoulders, and you can go and read that transcript there that has that additional information there. Now I want to talk about how this ties in with the uh, systems and methods for generating coherent matter uh, wave beams. This pattern here, uh, and look at what is being said here. Examples of applications for coherent matter uh, wave beams include single bath thermal extraction. This was talked about in 1982 or 1986 by Tom Bearden, and this is how you would create weather systems. You would either pump, suck energy out of a, a, a space, an area of space at a distance, uh, or you would pump energy into it, and if you do both, you end up by creating a vortex, and that creates your, your initiates your weather system. Uh, Ultra-sensitive accelerometers, blah, blah, blah. The interesting ones down here that are key, matter wave uh, projectiles and missiles, directed energy weapons, matter wave optics and cloaking, matter wave emissions and propulsion. And propulsion. Matter wave solitons, these are our EVOs, and high energy collision and high uh, precision matter, op uh, matter optics. Op optics. What you are looking there at there is the fact that Lockheed Martin, in this 2013 pattern, let me get you this specific pattern up so you can see it, and I have it here in another window, so let's get that up for you. So this is this pattern, and I've talked about this at length, and I've tied it through to many other things, and you can go and look at those presentations on uh, remoteview.icu, and I very specifically chose this as one of the first three presentations I put on remoteview.icu, because it ties so much together. But this is an awarded patent uh, and it was published on uh, July the 4th, uh, 2013, but it has uh, a priority from here. They have 10 years to make good on this. So they've got to start announcing this technology and asking for money to make it, because in my opinion, they already have it. So it's kind of like getting money for something you've already made. But they, they can then go and sell it because they've got 11 years, with, uh, 10 years to go with the patent. I mean, it's, it's, frankly, it's a scam. It's just a scam. It's already been bought and paid for by the American taxpayer and probably a lot of the rest of the world. It exists and probably they're going to use uh, a fake alien invasion nonsense using the technology they already have to get a huge amount of money because if the, if the subprime mortgage crisis wasn't enough of a scam and if the other scam about, well, we, we won't go into it too much, but you might have been aware of this thing that's been going about, it gives you the sniffles. Uh, if that's not enough, then this is like a, the final throwdown. You have an alien invasion. And this, of course, goes back to what Carol Rosen was saying back in 2001. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, in, in Greer's Disclosure Project, and I've written a lot about Greer and I've got, I'm very critical of him in certain respects. 
Uh, but I think he, in his recent presentation, he just put yes, out a show, yes. and I think he brought in uh, he brought a, 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 a relative of, of the Mellon family, right? Yes, Am John I right Warner. In saying John that? Warner, that's right. John so Warner, he's a cousin okay. of Chris Mellon, yeah. who's against the fake CIA-run, uh, you know, um, UFO op, which I think they're going to morph into, as you said a minute ago, the, the fake alien invasion. And as I've pointed out, and I made a video back in 2011, I think it was, because people were talking about this fake alien invasion, you might remember, back in 2011. Well, I, th I, think, I think it was actually in a wiki, I think it was Julian Assange who said Possibly. that, that in, in the documents that he has, he says the last scan they're going to pull is the fake alien yeah. invasion. And uh, this was, Greer pointed out, this was even mentioned in the coronavirus relief bill, not the fake alien invasion, but the... Oh, now UFO. you've done it, you've said the well, word. The, 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 the UFO... <laughs> in, Goodbye uh, video. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, they've said they this is in the re yeah. relief bill uh, some, something about <laughs> UFO uh, disclosure I haven't seen the document I'm, I think Greer will be reliable on that yeah. but this this is they're building up to this and what why I mentioned is I made a video in 2011 because there were people then back then who were saying this they were going to do it in 2012 you know the whole end of the mind I think what you what I think doing. what you have seen in what's just happened over the last 18 months is a test run yes. for how they can manipulate how minds is, yes. and how gullible yes. people yes. are. Seriously, seriously gullible. And yes. it's not so, you, you have the 2010 Rockefeller document, you have the spars from 2017. Right. Everything is completely detailed in extreme detail in these documents. And yet still, people believe What's going on? That's right, and real. so what they've shown is we can literally do anything, and they are like lambs to the slaughter. And and that, the expression is, well, you know, they can get away with murder, and we've got to add to that now because they can get away with mass murder, as I would see it. Mm -hmm. But you know, it is important that people understand that basically the, the the summary of what we're saying is they're claiming they don't know what these things are. We argue they know exactly what they are because they've developed the technology and probably what they're writing about in their report is their own stuff. Mm -hmm, they've mm -hmm. set the, the <laughs> incidents up. <laughs> and so, you know, if you look at what happened on 9-11, and, and this was the video I made back in 2010, where you see the, the towers turning to dust, and then you flip back to the 1996 Independence Day movie with the Empire State Building being blown up by a giant flying saucer, you put... You put the two things side by side, in other words, 9-11, as I did in the video, and the Independence Day claim, mm, mm. and then you bring in the last 12, 16 months, whatever, mm. there you are. That's it. That's really what the point, the, one, of the, well, one of the main points of this video is, isn't it? <laughs> and when this video is censored, don't worry, we have it recorded, so we we'll do. post it in a we'll different place. It, we'll post it on a platform which is uh, <laughs> not full, you know, quite so prone to censorship. And hopefully I won't get too many strikes. <laughs> but uh, anyway, these things need to be said because they are obviously all related. Yes. And, and so we have a situation where uh, I think we are both agreed, we are both agreed that this is, uh, it's a psychological operation. And uh, you, you sent me an image. Now, what, when was this image? Uh, uh, I believe this was either today or yesterday. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this now, and it's absolutely amazing. This is on Jeremy Vine, and it's on, a, I think it's like a morning program. Yeah, it's, it? uh, it's Channel 5 UK, uh, yeah. sort of 9.30 to 12 to 11 or something. So how would you deal with an alien invasion? There you go. How would you deal with it? Well, they know how you would deal with it. You would go, ah, uh, ah. Uh, Tell me when to breathe. Tell me when I should jump off a cliff. Tell me what I need to put in my arm. Tell me, please, please, what should I do? The world is coming to an end. And it's all going to be rubbish. Yes. It's going to be deception. nonsense. It's following the exact thing we've been talking about, deception. It's complete deception. They have this technology. As I said in the beginning of 2017, I looked into the camera and I said, you have got a few years to fess up to this because it's coming out. And they didn't know that I had seen the technology when I was not even 10 years old. Okay, they had no idea. And they could not have imagined how me meeting you is basically an impossibility. And it happened. <laughs> Do you remember what happened when we, went, we first no, met yeah, like, yeah, physically? Yeah, you yeah. tell the story. Well, I mean, this was the restaurant, wasn't it, where yeah. uh, 
we we got the menu and this well hold on hold on, on. so so we, we we're having a, a yeah. chat and we've the, talked about this in, we have yeah but i mean we're doing it together because it's like we, a, we, a randomly we, chosen restaurant well you you, you we, we were talking for about an hour in the station weren't we and we were having yeah, coffee yeah, yeah. And, then, and i said well are you hungry and you said yeah and i said okay so should we, should we go and get something to eat? And you said, yeah, I oh, know, no, 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 a street, didn't you? Yeah, something. yeah, there's a load of bars on there. Or okay, so well, you chose the street. So we walked me down to this street and then I could see and I knew what I wanted. I wanted a dirty burger. And uh, and there was this place called Cattle & Co. And so I, I, we, I said, well, it's Cattle & Co. They're probably going to have a burger. And I said, what did you want? I can't remember what I You said you wanted a salad. And I thought, okay, let's hope they got yeah. a salad. I walked in and, uh, uh, and uh, I said, do you have salads? And they said, yeah. And... Uh, I said, okay, we're going to take that table outside. So we walked outside and this, I think she was like 19, wasn't she? Like came out this waitress and she handed us the menu. And the first thing in the center of the menu was, uh, it was what you came for, dot, dot, dot. And then under that, un under the three dots was the 9.1.1 burger. A perfect uh, uh, yin yang, uh, sorry, perfect fusion uh, uh, of chicken and beef. A yin yang to soothe your heart or something. And it was literally a burger where they had the chicken on, in, in one part of the yin and, and the, the beef in the, the other part of the yin. And it had a, a battered piece of bacon flame coming out of the side, didn't it? Uh, 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 at the top of the, sort of just below the top of the bun, uh, below the bun. Wasn't it? And that, that was it. What are the chances of that? What yeah, are the chances amazing. of that? And so I would say that when you see this on your television, it is a scam. They are trying to scam us. And uh, I think that's pretty much all, all we have to say on that. Yeah, what I, I, I think... I'd like to speak for longer, but I've got a prior engagement. Yes, so. there, there's, there's, there's nothing else that they can do that they've pulled the financial one, yeah. they've sucked the money out of us for that, they, they've pulled the disease one, they've sucked the money out of that, they're trying the never-ending war, they, they did that first, and they'll probably have another war, um, but they, 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 they've sucked the money out of us for the, oh, the, the environmental, never-ending environmental problems. You've got the never-ending bogeyman, the never-ending disease, the never-ending environmental problem and the coup de grace is the absolute rubbish nonsense alien invasion and that's it and i'm sick to it I, when i saw stephen greer i thought that man looks how i feel about this nonsense we've had this i personally know we've had this because my father is not in contact with aliens and if he is they're friendly so there's they're not going to be attacking us so the only other possible option is that these are craft that the British had, or that a British man could have put on a show for him. So that's it. I think that's all we have to say. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've, I've got to dive off for now. We, we don't have time to take questions, so yeah. it's been a real pleasure, and thank you, because it, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, if it wasn't for Andrew, I would never have had the opportunities to, to meet the people and make the connections that led me to understand that this is coherent matter and then to find out that Lockheed Martin, no less, is specifically saying that this will do propulsion and all of the other things that we've observed in the lab over the years, it's, it's a slam dunk and it's the same characters involved. So that's all we can say. I expect this to be taken down, um, but we have it recorded. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Well, Bye bye for now.